welcome back. Uh, today we're just going to be doing some puzzles. And why? Well, two things. Um, I guess I should point out, uh, as became evident from... Uh, where was the forum discussion? Yeah, here it was. Uh, this wonderful gentleman. Um, IQQI apparently is his login here, but uh, he published... Uh, or he's pre-printing their paper for publication, um, talking about the open source neural network engine that they developed um, that plays Crazy House. Um, so this is all riding this wave of inspiration about machine learning and AI that has been ongoing for, well, it's been ongoing for a long time and the results are trickling in. Um, and here's yet another very strong result. Um, so here is the announcement of the Crazy ARA research paper publication. Um, learning to play the chess variant Crazy House above world champion level with deep neural networks and human data. Uh, I have not yet dove into this, but it's still very exciting to see. Um, just open source AI exploring um, the boundaries of uh, what machine learning can be useful for. Um, and yeah, this, um, I don't know the length, the how, uh, well, yeah, it was initially started as a semester project and then uh, exclusively learned to play Crazy House based on human games. Uh, first launched on Leechus in September 2018. Uh, it will be hosted Tuesday, 20 August 2019, uh, 2 o'clock UTC. Um, later, the same engine using a different neural network that was trained specifically to beat Stockfish or fine tuned on Stockfish self play games. Um, yeah, so this is. Crazy ARA and uh, Johannes Czech, I uh, suppose his name is. Um, uh, this is just quite the outstanding achievement. Uh, I'm very impressed. Um, so, in case you don't believe me, like I've been following this bot ever since it got launched on Lee Chess, or so I think I have. Um, and this is an open source neural network based engine for the chess variant of crazy house um so it's inspired by the alpha go alpha zero uh papers um like i've been saying there's this inspiration about machine learning that's really catching wildfire um and i think will only continue to become more important over time so dare i Here's an AI that outrates me by about 700 points. It outrates my bot, um, but all right, that's, uh, yeah, we'll give it a shot and then we'll get back to puzzle solving. So let's play some good 3-2 because I'm not going to have a chance in any other time control. Um, oh, crazy house, of course, of course. All right, we got the black pieces. So here's uh, Crazy House. The idea is once you capture pieces, uh, you can place them, bug house style. Hey, welcome. So yeah, we'll be going to puzzle solving just a minute here, but um, on account of this extraordinary achievement, I'm going to play one game of Crazy House against this AI, and we'll see just how quickly it roasts me. Yes, um, that's an interesting note, um, observation, and I'm not sure to what, ex or how you would test that hypothesis. Yeah, compared to alpha beta, um, I'm still not sure how you test the hypothesis. It's an intriguing hypothesis that, uh, somehow a neural network AI is more attuned, um, to playing this variant than it is to playing the standard variant. Um, it's really hard to say without a lot more data, but uh, I could believe that. I just don't know why. So this bishop is fantastic. I like that it controls the square. 
I dislike that I have no pawns in hand and really no way of obtaining a pawn in hand. I'm allergic to playing h6 here because that'll just somehow get me uh, destroyed. I don't see it yet how, but pushing pawns around your king is very dangerous business. Um, why 3D? Because uh, I've been playing with the 2D board forever and I enjoy the 3D board more. Um, so I'm not sure how I managed to get any pieces that I want in hand. I'm afraid of this knight d5 landing, so I think I'm going to push h6 despite really not wanting to push it. Um, I don't see any good moves. Um, so as far as I know, this is all black magic in terms of how this AI works. It's pretty fantastic. Uh, okay, so if I were to play queen g6, you would drop a knight, we'd exchange knights, and then I'd lose my queen. Um, if I bring the queen back to d8, once my opponent gets a pawn, such as knight takes e5, then they're threatening to fork me, but one fork isn't enough to decide this. They need another piece. Right, this, so this sort of thing crops up all over the place in Bug House and also in Crazy House. I suppose this is another way to get a pawn, and then you can get a pawn chain running. Um, really not liking being on the receiving end of this. I don't have any way of defending squares around my king. I really like my bishop, but I don't know how to proceed from here. I'm definitely out of my element. On the other hand, my opponent has nothing in hand, so... How bad could this be? Let's find out. <laughs> because of the spanning factor of Crazy House, uh, neural networks are more attuned to... Oh. 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 Uh oh. That's not good. Alright, this is forced. The threat is knight takes and then pawn drop on g7. The other threat is queen takes. Um... Mmm, that's unfortunate. Well, uh, I could do something with my bishop, I guess. We could pretend to put up resistance. Let's try. This is not going to end well. So, you remember I've been saying about don't push the pawns, but I didn't know how to get out of the pin. I didn't have any constructive attacking pl uh, plans. Um... All right, so king takes, pawn drop, king retreats. I'm just getting boxed in. Uh, on the other hand, the other this direction's going to be a more spectacular checkmate, so let's just go for it. Um, wait, is there not an immediate mate here? You're just going to take my queen. All right, well played. Uh, yeah, so this is Crazy ARA, you published by Johannes Czech. Um, so we can see what Stockfish thinks of this. Um, it's going to be pretty impressed. At least by my opponent's play. My own play, not that great, but... Um, yeah, no, this is just amazing to see... Um, uh, programming the rules for chess is one thing. Programming the rules for Crazy House is another. Uh, integrating all of that with a neural network is just nuts. And, um, yeah, congratulations uh, to the author for producing such a result. As expected, my first blunder here was h6. And, okay, I saw this, but I was terrified that, you know, the instant a pawn lands here, this is just really bad news. But apparently this is a reasonable way to proceed. Let's just slowly inch forward. Although probably I should have preferred some other way of opening the game and not putting the bishop here. I don't know. Um, yeah, we're going to switch over to doing puzzles. Because uh, I found this other fun thing. That So we're using the 3D board and just had the most awesome rumble pack effect uh, taking place here. So, like, the instant I click anything on the board, everything just bounces. 
Um, I, I don't know if that has something to do with like the size of my display or what's going on, but I think it's hilarious. Uh, but yeah, congratulations to Johannes for producing such an awesome engine and uh, publishing in his article for the scientific paper. Um, so I think the notion here is that I just take the bishop and then I play rook c7, the king runs away, and there's no, uh, even if my opponent plays rook f2, um, I can answer that with some sort of mating threat somehow. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I've looked through all the 2D boards and all the 3D boards, and just using the 2D board all the time, I've just found it very exhausting. But um, a lot of people enjoy it. Uh, the other notion that occurs to me... Well, two. One, that I might have seen this puzzle before. I might have seen the actual game or something when it was happening. Or it just really resembles something I have seen before. To the point where, like, Queen G5 is the answer. Uh, the rook goes over to G7 and then I snap the bishop. And there's really no counterplay, no matter what black tries to do because the queen's off sides. If I didn't know better, I'd say I've fallen for this in one of my games. Um, and that's perhaps why it left such a strong impression on me. But yeah, we got bouncing pieces, so what's not like, what not to like here? Um, so yeah, if you want to play against Crazy ARA, that engine will be online for the next uh, 12 hours or so. And then the next 12 hours after that, a crazy ARA fish will have um, the same engine but tuned using Stockfish um, as uh, using its games as a basis for tuning the engine. So you'll see something, I guess, more resembles the alpha beta evaluation or something. I'm not sure. The, like Stockfish's evaluation function plus the alpha beta search produces a certain result that produces Stockfish's games, which were used to train Crazy ARA. Um, so the model that's playing right now is trying to play more like a human. Uh, tomorrow you might see it play more like in a traditional Crazy House engine, I guess. I'm not sure. It should be interesting either way to see what the differences are between the games played today and tomorrow. Um, so, uh, and to your earlier point, I'm curious. Um, yeah, the alpha beta search certainly relies on move ordering um, and certainly relies on, uh, what's it? Um just the branching factor not exploding out of control. I don't know that neural networks per se have anything to do with the success of AI in variants like Shogi and uh, Crazy House. Um, perhaps it's more has to do with Monte Carlo tree search. And to that end, um, some AIs are emerging with MCTS being used. Um, for games like Shogi and Crazy House. So we could compare a more conventional engine that's not necessarily trained by a um, neural network that doesn't have the machine learning aspect. And you could try that and compare it to the neural network and see, um, well, what's going on there. The other thing that's kind of funny is that um, OK Stockfish is a more conventional uh, applicative AI or well, I guess all engines are, but it's a more traditional uh, AI in terms of it uses the alpha beta search. Um, and um, sorry, I'm just losing where my thought was going there. Um, is there a chess engine based on neural networks? Yes. Uh, you will find many engines uh, playing online on Lee Chess. Um, using the Leela Chess Zero engine developed by GCP. Um, I know him by that handle online. I have not... 
uh, it seems like that name is more visible or easier to find than uh, what his actual name is. Um, but yeah, that... And at one point I did know what his actual name was, and now I'm embarrassed to have forgotten it. But Leela Chess Zero is... Um, uh, I don't know if it's the first successful neural network engine or machine learning engine, um, but it's the first one that started playing on Lee Chess and on other websites. Um, so there are machines, there are a engines that are based on uh, machine learning. How does it compare to Stockfish? Um, well, so I think, what, last year uh, it just had started learning and um, within a matter of months it had surpassed Stockfish. So um, that was pretty exciting. A lot of computing power went into that result. Um, but yeah, it also is hardware dependent because uh, a GPU will accelerate it quite a bit. Um, I know there was a lot of excitement about the Alpha Zero engine, um, as applied to Go, as applied to chess, as applied to whatever games they decide to apply it to next. Um, so there was a lot of excitement there. The papers that uh, Google DeepMind published were good papers. The first research experiment left a lot of people unconvinced or a lot of hobbyists who were interested in chess uh, were unconvinced by the paper um, I myself thought well okay while this doesn't demonstrate that uh, AlphaGo was better than any other AI necessarily at chess it was still an outstanding achievement on it in its own right regardless of whatever the ranking of uh, that engine was at that time. And since that time, of course, uh, Google has um, doubled down both on their hardware and um, playing under fairer, however you want to consider a match fair. I don't know, can a match be fair? Maybe, maybe not, but certainly demonstrated that uh, AlphaGo is the stronger engine. But um, without it being open source, I didn't find that so exciting either. And then along came Leela Chess Zero, um, inspired by the research paper, following the same techniques, trained with lots of um, uh, people running their copies of uh, the engine and their tuning network, and uploading the results to the shared server. Um, uh, I think also borrowing some result, uh, some computing power from the Google Compute Engine. Um, they're borrowing a lot of power, honestly. Um, so yeah, Leela Chess Zero is the first open source engine to have trumped Stockfish, which um, was excellent, honestly. Seeing an engine that can even defeat a human um, that's trained based on a neural network, I did not think was going to happen this decade. I did not expect anything like what AlphaGo uh, or what AlphaZero have done uh, to happen in the next five to ten years. Um, so it's ahead of its time. Um, and so there's quite a bit of excitement about uh, among academics uh, about... Um, these theoretical subjects that are now becoming more uh, real. It's not just about natural language processing and an AI winning um, on Jeopardy. Um, it's now about training machines uh, or uh, based on very limited domain knowledge that have to figure out the meaning of these symbols and be able to apply them in a wide variety of contexts. Uh, if you're looking at the Stockfish versus Alpha Zero rematch, you'll find that 
They played under a variety of different time controls and a variety of different openings. Um, and that, uh, yeah, the Google's engine outperformed Stockfish um, uh, very handily. And the games are just beautiful. Um, yeah, it, it, there's, you're right, the, the field is constantly being explored. And each time the boundary of what machines can do is expanded, there's quite a bit of excitement about it. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> there's a lot of uh, speculation and excitement about uh, autonomous machines and vehicles and autonomous... Uh, uh, what did they call it again? I don't know if agent is the proper term for it, um, but certainly the notion, um, <laughs> the notion of machines doing fantastic things has been around much longer than Ask Jeeves. It's been something uh, theorized by, uh, about by philosophers um, uh, in ancient Greece and such. Uh, and this fascination about machines and robots. And, uh, yeah, it's... Um, there's nothing new. But uh, seeing... Um, it, it's funny, like, today we take the internet for granted, right? Uh, internet wasn't around decades ago. Technology is evolving very quickly. And, yeah, self-driving vehicles uh, are... I mean, in some limited domain, um, you could have something and call it a self-driving vehicle. Um, certainly people have written programs that'll move robots around in like a soccer field and okay, yeah, that's exciting. Um, but it's just funny, like uh, back in, uh, I don't know, the 90s. We didn't really get what the internet was or why it would be valuable to us or um, uh, a lot of things it just didn't occur to us at the time. And now we take this technology for granted. I, I think that a similar thing will happen um, with just machines and self-driving vehicles and such. And whenever that does happen, uh, people will be like, oh, well, that's great. <laughs> it's just funny, like. Today we do take the internet for granted. Just this wealth of being able to communicate with each other and uh, research uh, subjects so easily. Um, and there's a lot of negative things that come with the internet too, and that's okay. Um, I am struggling with this puzzle. I have been thinking about it. I'm just bad at puzzles. And these puzzles are hard. Um... Man, I wish that, like, Queen F2 here would work. But yeah, I just find... So yeah, I click on the squares, and again, it bounces. And I don't know if that has something to do with the square being selected or not. I don't know. Like, Queen F2 looks beautiful. Reminds me of some games that I think I've seen in books. Um, where the authors comment, like... Oh, this piece looks so good, but what does it really do there? What's the threat? And it's like, if I play queen f2, I'm threatening bishop g2 and queen g2 mate. Um, and I was going to say that's instantly refuted by rook e2, but it isn't, because I just take the damn rook. Or I take the bishop. And if rook a2, okay. And if queen e2, yeah, no, it's it's got to be queen f2. I don't know why I psyched myself. Oh! That's funny. Um, very resourceful machine. But again, we take this for granted, don't we? Like, um, last century, it was just people would laugh when machines would want to play against humans. And now they laugh when humans play against machines. Isn't that great? Um, it'd be world changing. Uh, yeah? Yeah, there will come a point where, uh, well, <laughs> uh, 
uh, where it can be safer for machines to operate in some domains than it can be for humans to operate in those same domains. Um, that will come uh, one domain at a time. I don't know if even when it becomes safer for machines to be the ones uh, that drive themselves, I don't think people will trust it. The, it's going to be like, uh, I don't know. That's just my guess. Um, I have nothing really to base that uh, upon. <laughs> hey, IJH. I see you're quite excited, as usual. My least favorite variant, blindfolded. Why do you want me to play standard chess blindfolded? All right. Uh, so... Let's see. Like, I'm considering rook d8, but then knight takes rook takes, queen takes check. Ruins everything. Um, maybe I play queen, or rook e8, rook e2. But that's really slow. Surely white's got to have some escape if I play two slow moves. Um... Besides, didn't we do... No, you guys didn't see my blindfold game. Because um, I didn't end up streaming it. Yeah, a lot of people have much to learn about chess. It's a difficult game. Increasingly, I'm starting to appreciate um, other games, like Go. Yes, they're very difficult games as well. But in chess, uh, and as one of my uh, friends from college who pointed this out, you make one mistake and things can be just over. And yes, that can happen in Go too. Um, but in Go, there's quite a bit more depth to the game. Even if you're losing, there's still an ability to play, to learn from every game. Uh, you can make mistakes and come back from them quite often. Um, <laughs> I say that, and then I'm starting to think about, uh, you're mentioning other variants like Crazy House. I'm thinking about Shogi, which I've streamed before. And I've streamed it several times. I've played, I don't know, dozens of games of Shogi. Which is nothing. It really isn't. But, um... I also watched hundreds of games of Shogi, and I really get the impression that it's a much sharper Crazy House. That, yes, Crazy House is difficult, um, but Shogi is just insane. Like, it's Crazy House on steroids. You, it's very tactical. Uh, yeah, and the games can take many moves as well. Which is kind of ironic, isn't it? Like, these pieces dominate an 8x8 board very nicely and complement each other. Um, in Shogi, you place pieces on wrong squares and it can take a very long time to rearrange them. Oh, um, yes, I have visited the uh, chess variants. Uh, I'm bl drawing a blank. It's like Python variants or Python chess variants or something. I have visited it. It's excellent. Um, I've played, I think I've played several games on there. It's been a long time. I, it, I haven't been streaming for quite a while here. Um, just work has been keeping me busy. But, um, if I remember right, this uh, Python Chess Variants server was very well done. Um, played some games on it, it worked very nicely. Um, and offers variants like CR1 Chess that aren't on Lee Chess at the moment. Your bugbear is how long the opening takes. Yeah, but uh, you feel the game isn't overly determined by theory. I guess that's an interesting point, because if you have a game that goes for so many moves, 
opening theory will not decide it. Maybe that's my tension with the game of Shogi, is that um, I can't just get lucky in an opening and hope that um, it'll just carry me to victory. Uh, in Crazy House, sometimes I just play like a madman, and um, that can have good results sometimes. So I am so stumped here. Like, so the one thought that occurs to me is that Lee Chess Puzzles have a unique solution. What that can tell you is that it can't be possible for both Rook GE8 and Rook AE8. Those both cannot be the correct solution if there is a single correct solution. Um... So I'm thinking this rook needs to be on this file so that my knight doesn't get taken. Yeah, so if the knight gets taken, I can take the rook. And so because this rook is tied down, then I can think that rook e8 actually could be a solution because rook g e8 is not a solution. If rook g e8 and rook e8 a e8 had the same sort of result, um then I couldn't just guess that rook ae8 is correct. But here, I, this is a valid guess, because uh, the other move is uh, achieving the same purpose, um, does not work. Um, yeah, I kind of wish knight e2 were, were it. It's not so simple. Um, so I've been struggling with this. I've been guessing a lot on 2000 and uprated puzzles. So here I submit another guess. The board balances again as each piece moves. It's very exciting. Um, and so what I wanted to play next was rook e2. Um, but now I see, well, damn, there's this knight that's... Well, even if the knight takes there, I'm not afraid of that, am I? Um, so rook e2, bishop e2, bishop, rook, queen. Yeah, so... Hmm. I mean, this just wins. Unless knight e2 is the right move. So, so far these both look equally good. Um, which means that one of them has a problem. If knight e2, bishop c6, and I don't have a threat. Rook e2 has a simple direct threat. Alright, queen takes, and then I get a free queen. 2200 rated puzzle solved by the virtue of the fact that rook g e8 fails. Um, and because that fails, I was able to guess the other rook moving to e8. But if this move didn't have any apparent downside, then I'd have to reason about, well, the both of these can't be correct, so it has to be something else. So, alright, here we got another puzzle that has a single solution. Always look at captures and checks. Bishop takes g6 is a capture. Uh, it threatens queen takes h7 mate. Um, it looks stupid. Uh, rook e7, rook f1 mate. It's not so hot. Um, bishop e4 hitting the queen. Knight takes e4. And that ends that journey. Well, no, it doesn't, because I have queen e6. And I could do queen takes and then take back and then rook f1 mate. So the journey goes on a little bit longer there. Uh, there's bishop f8, and, or bishop h6 with the intention of bishop f8. Um, what else is there here? There's got to be lots of ideas. Oh yeah, this bishop h6 uh, covers the f1 square twice, so that I'd be able to move the e rook to e7. Um, so if I play that, probably rook f7, defending the 7th rank, and I don't have anything that I can do here other than sack the bishop as indicated by that arrow. Um, I'm beginning to think that's not so exciting. I kind of wish my bishop on c1 could go somewhere so that I could get in um, rook e7 for free. But rook e7 still doesn't do anything, because all my other pieces are off sides. 
<sighs> Wait, why don't I just take the bishop? If I take the bishop, I'm up a piece. What am I looking at? I get a free piece, and then I can play bishop h6, and then I can play rook e7. And, I mean, the only thing I have to worry about is, like, this knight landing in f2, but it can't even get there. So, yeah, this is a free bishop. So, this is exactly how Kotov tells you to think in his book, Think Like a Grandmaster. Where he tells you, first, guess a random move. Keep looking at that. Spend, like, five hours analyzing that move. Then that move doesn't work. Okay, now you got, like, five minutes on your clock. Spend four minutes of those next five analyzing another move. That doesn't work. Okay, spend your last minute on your clock analyzing a third move. All right, your minutes expired. None of those moves work. Randomly pick a different move and play it. Exactly what Kotov tells you to do. Uh, no, if you've actually read his book, um, Think Like a Grandmaster, he tells you you got to list all the candidate moves first and then logically proceed through them. Don't do this. Uh, I like my explanation way better, though. Because it is so relatable. Like, if you're the weekend tournament player, you have done that. I've done it. Everybody does it. Uh, every amateur does it. And that's why we're amateurs. Alright, I didn't see Rook F2. So, yeah, I jumped the gun on taking that free bishop, because that might not actually be free. Except, we're doing a puzzle. And because we're doing a puzzle, we know this works. <laughs> um, so, how do I do something devastating here? Hmm, so there's a mate threat on g2. As long as I do something about the mate threat and don't hang a zillion pieces in the process, I'm probably fine. Rook g1 foots the bill. There's nothing more to look at. Because I've got every square covered by um, this uh, trio. The queen covering this diagonal, the bishop, and this bishop cover everything over here that isn't covered by these pawns. Um... You, Black just can't get any of his pieces into the neutral zone. So we just play Rook G1. And success. That's it. Yeah, moving the queen over would hang the C2 bishop, although it was my first thought. Um, yeah, and this is like... I've said it quite a few times that like I like puzzles on other sites a little bit better. Except they don't have this rumble pack feature, where the board shakes every time you click a piece. Uh, is there other ways I can get this, like, to freak out? Alright, so if I go over here, like, I get some scroll action. I don't know. Like, somehow, as I bounce... As I put my cursor over the view the solution button, this gets larger. I draw back, it gets smaller again. Um... Yeah, as I go through the rating graph, everything bounces. As I click on pieces, the board bounces. It's um, Now maybe the fact that I've got like U-block origin blocking... No, I don't have it blocking remote fonts on this site, because then I wouldn't get all the icons. Um, I have Ghost reinstalled, but that shouldn't do anything either. So I'm not really sure. It's probably just my choice of esoteric browser that's at fault. But uh, it's pretty funny. So this is a queen trap, and we know it's a queen trap because black's not getting checkmated and all of his other pieces are not exposed. And it's not like I can push this to get a past pawn. So it's a queen trap. Bingo. Check. And free queen. Dumb puzzle, gonna downvote it. Next puzzle. Um, I mean, queen traps can happen in your real games. I've had one game... Yeah, I've had, no, in all my years of tournament and um, 
occasional participation in simuls. I've had exactly two games where a queen has been trapped. Um, uh, I've had a third where I won my opponent's queen uh, to a ridiculous pin, but only two proper queen traps, and one of them was in variations and analysis, and I actually missed it during the game. So I ended up going for a different variation that didn't even have the queen trap in it and just got a bad opening. Um, granted, it was a ridiculous opening, and I've known for playing that sort of stuff in tournaments. Um, I've done better than that recently. I'm actually starting to play reasonable openings um, and occasionally get um, a position that's not completely inferior. Um which is pretty exciting that like I could put in so much work reading so many opening books and virtually none of it stick um, but when I do land something in the opening it goes phenomenally well uh, I guess I'll look into ghostry and what the controversy is there not so sure I understand it, but I will research it. So if you take, if you look at a puzzle like a puzzle, calling a queen trap because there are no pieces exposed, etc., does it even help in an actual game? No. <laughs> um, yeah, because like I'm looking at. Um, puzzles that are not targeted at my FIDE or USCF rating level. Um, if I were to look at things that were in chess books, um, uh, okay, it would be wrong of me to say that I'm ready for Dvoretsky's Endgame manual, but um, or really any of his books, but um, I should be looking more at that sort of instructive material uh, than this sort of thing. Even uh, books with just random puzzles, like there's a book Tactics Time, I believe it's written by a national master and another author. I wish I could remember their names. I saw the book at a library several years ago. I do not remember the author's name, but it's called Tactics Time, and it features random positions. Positions that you don't know that it's going to be a checkmate or a queen trap or that sort of thing. You just know that um, there's one best move, but there's sometimes some other good moves there. There's a lot to consider. Um, this sort of puzzle here is not going to help me. It's just entertainment. Um, yeah, this is the Vivaldi browser. Uh, yeah, I have also installed Opera before. When, when Lee Chess was releasing version 2, I had installed a multitude of browsers and intended to demo them all as part of the v version 2 upgrade. And then, like, minute 1 of that upgrade had some issues. And I just panicked. <laughs> um so I just said, all right, everybody just calm down. We're going to play some games. Everything's going to be okay. And people could see that I was streaming and we we're just playing some, um, doing some puzzles, playing some blitz games, um, uh, just enjoying the upgrade and looking at all the new things that got released. Um, um, so in that panic, I had switched out of my mentality of let's demo all the browsers on V2 the first day that it's released, which probably would not have done V2 much justice. Um, and I've never gone back and replicated the experiment. Um, although I did try out a number of browsers, but uh, again, that point wasn't to compare Vivaldi to Opera or anything. Um, although... Formerly, I had used Opera Browser. I forget why I had to stop using it or why I did stop using it. Um, I don't recall. Something maybe about Water Fox seemed too allu uh, alluring. I don't know. 
Um, but yeah, and I ultimately ended up switching my main browser to Vivaldi upon hearing some of uh, what had taken place in terms of certificates and um, collection of information and such from other browsers. Yeah. So yeah, I've looked at the tab management. I've tried it out. It's beautiful. I can't wrap my head around it, but I can understand how categorizing tabs could be useful. Um, I just, like my own workflow, doesn't involve that many browser tabs open at once. Um, did I like Vivaldi more than Opera? Yes. Um, I always found um, the Opera configuration, the settings, uh, tricky to navigate and not as responsive as Vivaldi. And Vivaldi is uh, driven by a community or I don't recall who actually develops it. Um, but uh, the notion that Opera once had the sense of a community and doesn't really anymore. And that this is more um, uh, community oriented and driven by feedback from the community and welcoming feedback and open source and such. Um, that definitely was a plus in my book here. Um, but yeah, it seems like uh, the main author of um, the Vivaldi browser gave everything a good deal of thought. <laughs> Basically, for portability, they do it all in browser instead of relying on the Windows API. So you don't get clear type, um, but you get uh, Google's terrible approximation of font rendering. Uh, let's see. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so yeah, I am, uh, I'm trying to think of something reasonable to say about that. I'm not a web designer. Um, that all said, I use the liberation fonts, um, uh, both with my desktop and in my browser. So like my user style, uh, that I publish, uh, that does all this fun coloring. Also, we'll use the liberation fonts if you have them available. Um, and they are freely available, you just have to install them on your machine. And I don't know more a better way to um, uh, make the sort of styling available uh, using, like, browser fonts or something. So the way I have it configured right now, it just uses the font using a CSS rule that doesn't define the font in the CSS rule or anything like that. But if you've got liberation fonts installed and your browser's configured or whatever, if it needs to be configured to use them, um, the CSS rule will use those fonts. Um, now that said, Lee Chess uses its own fonts that have all these wonderful uh, symbols. And I don't have any analog of that uh, for a liberation font plus the symbols, but that's okay. <laughs> but yeah i think these fonts look okay um in terms of uh once you install the liberation fonts they look decent with the site um but yeah certainly clear type um looks beautiful and it's difficult to replicate Um, so I'm stumped. Like, I'm looking at rook takes f6, pawn takes knight d7, and knight takes f6 check. Which doesn't do anything. It looks fun. I look at the fun looking moves. So, candidate moves, rook takes, knight takes, bishop back. Um, I'm calling rook g3 a candidate move, but it's probably not. 
Um, what else? G4. Are there any other candidate moves? Like, I'd want to move the queen, but it, moving it anywhere doesn't seem to do anything. Other than maybe get me made it on C1. I could play rook, F, rook takes knight. Pawn takes rook. Rook g3 check. That caught, thought just crossed my mind. Should I be trying to solve puzzles? Maybe not. <laughs> but man, if this were Crazy House, that could be a fun combination if I had the other rook in hand. Um, and yeah, that said, my puzzle rating, 21, what's that, 81, 91, uh, my display looks a little blurry. Yeah, 2191. So, um, you too can reach a 2200 rating if you can hallucinate those things. Rook takes G takes Queen G4 check, we're thinking. All right, and so yeah, one notion there would be if king h8, knight takes pawn, uh, king h8 to h7, bishop d3 check, f5, um, and there's got to be some mate after that. The knight on f7, bishop takes, pawn takes, queen takes check, uh, king g7, I'm running out of pieces. Um, so I've done something wrong there, but yeah, queen g4... If king h8, knight takes f7, um, king h7. I'm just trying to put that variation out first because it looks the easiest to defeat. And then I can free up my mind to look at other variations. But it's the easiest one to defeat, and I still haven't defeated it. So, mm, I mean, I don't see anything wrong with it. Um... I just don't see anything right with it either. Well, exposing the king is pretty right. Um, plus, I suggested rook takes f6, so it's got to be a good move, because I was the one who suggested it. Plus, there's really not a whole lot else going on here. Like, if I did knight takes f7, I don't have a follow-up. Queen h5 doesn't quite do it. Um... So, yeah, the only forcing move in this position, aside for something crazy, and this doesn't quite work, um, would be rook takes knight. Um, knight d7 also doesn't cut it because the knight moving away doesn't really spell black's demise at all. Um, bishop d7 is tempting with a threat of trying to take on e6, which doesn't really force black to do anything. So yeah, the only forcing move has got to be the right move. Beautiful. Black doesn't even respond. And then we just move the rook back and call it a day. So this is baiting me. Do I want to take on f7? Um, I think the answer is no, because rook takes f7, queen c1. And then if I trade on c1, I have to play bishop back to f1. And then bishop takes e5 wins uh, the piece back. So taking on f7 would lose a vital tempo. Um, because of this intermezzo queen c1, which prevents me from taking the queen. And also prevents me from bringing my queen out to g4 and such. So, but, um, if rook takes f7 is wrong, then only one of these two moves, rook f4 or rook f3, can be correct. They cannot both be the correct move. So if only one of those is correct, um, I have to be able to refute the other one. And this is where Lee chess puzzles are kind of silly. <laughs> um, so Lee chess puzzles have a single correct solution. So I have to be able to refute one of these in order to be able to accept the other. Otherwise, I've missed something pretty fundamental. Rook f4, f6, yeah, but the other problem is, like, if I play rook f3, f6 anyway, knight g4, f5, and, okay, I guess they, I play my knight back up, 
and then they take twice on e5 and i've lost a pawn that's not so bad yeah yeah rook f4 f6 and i don't have a sack sack made opportunity so this has got to be fine it's still stupid that they don't take the rook like force me to prove it i know we were saying queen g4 but what's the follow-up is it like knight d7 knight f6 or something but if knight d7 queen here queen d8 covers the f6 square so what's the key idea plus two queen g4 king h8 knight f7 king h7 g3 yeah i totally saw g3 yep 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 who doesn't see g3 here totally obvious completely winning silly puzzle we're gonna try to download it if lee chess will allow me to <laughs> all right we downloaded it somehow yeah no that's a good point uh making lift for the king the bishop uh doesn't attack f4 and such um yeah so i think we might do a few more of these um and then wrap it up so let's see bishop d7 also we're nearing the 2000 or 2200 barrier so that's exciting um so in this position, my candidate moves are castle king side, castle queen side, and I don't know. <laughs> Bishop a3. Um, only one of those candidate moves is legal, by the way. Oh yeah, we got our rumble pack installed. Yeah, it just quakes the entire board every time I do something. It's, it's super awesome. If I could figure out like what's causing that, I might just become a web developer or a web designer or somebody who knows JavaScript. Yeah, sorry. I'll try not to do too many things. Um, so if I go bishop a3, that stops black from castling. And then white declares victory. That doesn't quite seem right. Um... Also, candidate move king f1, intending king g2. Um, that just seems very slow, and black can do something else. Also, a4, threatening a5. <laughs> um, but then they could play bishop c5, and I can take their pawn and win a rook. Or I could play a4, they play a5, and then what? Then do I do bishop a3? Then they do. Well, bishop c5 falls for the same thing. Um, do I do rook d1, intending rook d3? No, they could still play bishop f4 to cover the e-pawn if they had to. So, this is a hard puzzle. <laughs> bishop c1. Yes. Yeah. That has to be correct. Having eliminated every other candidate move, we play another legal move, and then we just go win the rook. Um, I'm watching out for queen e3 check, because I actually do value my king. Um, but I can take the rook with check, and then worry about queen e3 by dropping my queen back to d4. Um alternatively perhaps i could do rook take c1 oh but then like they my king ends up on d1 they take this with check oh but they don't win the rook and then i get to tuck my king away on b1 which i saw from the very beginning and didn't totally make up uh in the last few seconds here now i'm curious is winning two rooks um really the way to go here bishop takes e6 leads to an equal end game so that can't be right or it might be a pawn up but it's still pretty even uh but if this were a tournament game and like bishop takes e6 and white were just up a piece then that might be preferable to uh over going down the rabbit hole with queen takes rook 
if you can find a way to simplify the position and guarantee that you're going to win in that simpler position, that might just be the way to go in tournament play. Uh, if you're playing online or playing for an audience, maybe you don't do that. Maybe you go the other way on purpose and take risks and see where the wind uh, takes you. Or if you're just bored with chess, um, maybe do that too. But yeah, taking this is the exciting move, and bishop takes here um, would not have got obtained an advantage. What has my curiosity is that once this king moves, surely it's dangerous to take this rook, right? Um, so like, if they play king e7, do we really want to take this rook? Is that safe? Queen takes rook. Queen e3 check. Uh, if we play king d1, we get mated, so we have to go king f1. And black has a perpetual. So taking the rook there would be a blunder. Um, but where does our queen go? d4? It seems like that's forced here, right? Oh, sorry. Didn't mean to bounce that. Queen takes rook is okay, because we have bishop e2. If not for bishop e2, then queen takes rook could be catastrophic, in my opinion. Alright, so we crossed 2200. We'll do one more. I'm calling this a bad puzzle because it stops one move too early. Or two moves too early. You should have to find a proper defense for white. Once you've gotten yourself into that mess, you need to be able to get yourself out of it. Alright, my first thought, queen takes bishop. Is there any move other than queen takes bishop? Not really. Uh, how is this a puzzle? I mean, what puzzled me at first here was queen takes bishop, king h1, and it appears that white's queen is about to get skewered, or pinned, depending on whether you value the queen or the king more. Um... Yeah, well, that's a fair point. I still think it's not a very instructive puzzle, although you're right, there's more than one good move. But such is chess. You shouldn't have to say that every position has exactly one good move. If you try to go to a tournament and play that way, your games will end in disaster. Unless you're like playing the dragon every game and there is legitimately only one good move in every position. Or something crazy like that. Most positions will have um, some depth to them. Other than your ability to calculate. Um, so queen takes and then queen f4 looks really nice. Doesn't quite cut it, but... Boy, does it come close. Um, well, hang on. Queen takes, king h1, rook c2. Rook g1 uh, would lose a rook on account of queen takes rook check, and then rook takes queen. Yeah, I think um, if you're like below 2,000 in your over-the-board rating, these could be of some value to you. Uh, particularly under 1,600 um, over-the-board um, in terms of FIDE or USCF rating. Um, these are probably of more value to you, but for me, this is entertainment value. Um, so we're going to take the bishop, and we're going to play the fork. And the fork didn't work because I missed something, and I was so tempted to hit that view the solution button. But I'm going to tough it out for a second and try this. And then we're going to go for the fork. So I don't know what the big difference was between bishop e4 and the immediate rook c2. Um, and I was not going to puzzle over that on stream for uh, many minutes. So I just felt like playing a move. I played a move. I missed the point. I still don't understand it, but I'm making an effort right now. It's not a very good effort. Um, but like this looked very good to me. How could this not be good? Where's the gotcha here that I missed? Where is the tactic that ruins my day? 
It's not f4 because f4 bishop e4 mate. It's not h4 because queen takes h4. It's, it's not rook g1 because we looked at that already. I take the rook with check and then I take their queen. Um, it could just be that bishop e4 is better. And therefore, because that is better, that this must be worse. But this looks pretty forcing. Um, the looks can be deceiving. So the threat, um, the main threat is rook take, oh, I'm sorry, bishop e4 check here, then rook takes e2. Um, I don't know why inverting the move order works better. It is a very good trick in an over-the-board game. If you find a combination and it doesn't work for some reason, try your moves in the other sequence and see if that works any better. Sometimes it does. Um, in those cases, often your opponent will have not considered that you could play the moves in the other order. Um, it's a really useful trick. All right, I'm not seeing how white defends this. Queen takes d4. Oh, and then bishop e4 is no good. But I was considering queen d2 here. But white is plus 2 to the good because queen d2 doesn't do anything. Rook c1 isn't as good as I hoped. And yeah, my rook's just off sides. That's unfortunate. So yeah, that's why you have to centralize the bishop first. Um... Because with the other move order, if we ended up in a similar position and white took on d4, here I would give this check. Oh, no I don't. Just kidding. Um, you didn't see that. Here I would have this. And then um, if rook takes uh, this check. Uh, I was going to joke around about there being some other mate here, but no, you just, just go for it. It's right there. So this is the harder way to do it. Um, granted, I missed a lot of these variations. In a real training exercise, you'd want to look at all these. Um, you don't want to just consider your opponent's single defense. You want to consider what if they do things that don't work. Um, you have to make sure those other alternatives really don't work. Because if they do, then you've sacked a piece for nothing. Um... But anyway, yeah, it seems like I have some CSS issues. Well, here's the thing. If I turn off my special style, I still have the issues. But it could be my choice of browser or plugins or something like that. So anyway, um, thanks for watching. It's been fun. And we'll see you next time. Have a good night.